So you're going to feel warmed up. The, the dynamic warm up for a sprint should take five, 10, 15 minutes or something. And I think you miss out on the brain because if you can stimulate the brain with gator ball, your, your, your visual system, your uh, vestibular system, your proprioception, put it, put everything together, just get this light up within your brain. You're going to feel a lot better going into a sprint. Uh, and that's felt for me there. And it feels for, feels for me now. Cause it's like, I'll go play med ball, volleyball, or play spike ball for like 20, 30 minutes. And I feel pretty ready to sprint. I feel a lot more ready to sprint or to jump after that than I do if I did like a sprint or, or jump specific warm up. So I think, yeah, I think, I think the warm ups need to start going towards getting the entire brain involved, mm-hmm. which would, I guess, be a game. Like why else, what else do we need to change? Let's just, just play a game. That was Jake Tura. And you're listening to the just fly performance podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by our longtime sponsor, simplyfaster.com. There's two items I'd like to talk to you about today that you can find in Simply Faster's online store. Whether you're a coach or an athlete, these are both things that you'll find highly useful as tools in your training toolbox. The first is blood flow restriction training methods. And after hearing about blood flow restriction training for years now, as well as the results that athletes are getting with it, especially in, for example, uh, lactate sports like swimming, 100 meter freestyle. And not only hearing of that, but also seeing how much some swimmers had liked that type of training method, I knew I had to start trying it out myself. So I've been utilizing the air bands. I really enjoy it, both the, uh, the feeling while I'm actually training with them, as well as seeing the visual result of spending time training with the methods and then the strength result. Uh, they've been a really cool training tool, and I would definitely recommend checking into air bands. Uh, simplyfaster.com also has B Strong brand blood flow restriction. The second item is the VMAX Pro. And this is a new option for velocity-based training, barbell tracking. It provides valuable load-based data, including speed in all phases of a lift, and it delivers key metrics such as power, velocity, distance, as well as duration of effort. The VMAX Pro system measures any lift you can think of. It's portable, durable, and intuitive. You can check out these two items and much more at our sponsor, simplyfaster.com's online store. Let's get on to the show. Welcome to another show. Two elements of training that we have frequently discussed on this podcast and that I think about a lot are vertical jump training and then the use of gameplay, either as a warm up or within training itself, like gamifying training. We've had some really cool conversations on this show with those two topics. And I'm really excited for our guest today, Jake Tura, to share his knowledge specifically on these two elements and a whole lot more. Jake currently works at Velocity Training Center as a strength and conditioning coach, and prior to that, he was a college strength coach for seven years. Jake is the owner of jackedathlete.com and also the Jacked Athlete podcast, where he teaches athletes and coaches principles on muscle gain, jumping higher, rehab from jumper's knee, and athletic performance principles. For the show today, as I mentioned, games and vertical jump, Jake is going to share some of the last lessons he learned as a collegiate strength and conditioning coach and then things that he has been continuing to learn in the private sector, uh, very much on the level of games, what we'll be talking today. He's also going to be talking about, in addition to using games to fully light up an athlete's brain for the sake of the training session, he'll be talking about infusing that with vertical jump training, infusing that with sprint training. You may have heard me talk with Rob Assis in a previous podcast about suggesting these elements, and it's really cool to, to start seeing what coaches are doing on that level of Uh, Moving past just having a a pure, I guess you could say canned practice session and into some of that chaotic and highly potentiating element that game game gameplay, excuse me, can bring about. Jake is also going to get into some things that he has learned in uh, interviewing some of the best dunkers in the world, athletes with some of the highest vertical jumps in the world, and what he has learned from their training practices from youth all the way to elite high-level athlete and what has changed over time, as well as the powerful foundations of what has helped those athletes to achieve the levels they have. Finally, Jake will get into some ideas on jump training biomechanics, and then some knee health and rehabilitation ideas specifically revolving around the differences between what isometric training can offer an athlete and what kinetic chain training can offer an athlete when we're looking at helping athletes to have the healthiest knees possible. Jake is a coach with immense curiosity and tons of skin in the game. It was really fun to catch up and chat, and I know you'll love this conversation. Let's get on to episode 266 with coach Jake Tura. Jake, it's great to have you back on the show, man. Could you start off by sharing just a little bit about 
well, I have two like kind of sections of learning that I'd like to ask you about. I know you, what you've been up to this summer, but before then, uh, you recently, I know, left your college coaching post. And um, what were some of the last things that you were learning as you were on that transition there? Yeah. So, well, I went into the job. I was at Youngstown for three years. I went into the job probably like every other strength coach or the majority where you see things through the strength and conditioning lens of everyone needs to get stronger. Everyone needs to jump higher. Everyone needs to sprint faster and applying this to team sports. And then it's like, when you get in the weight room, you think that people want to be in there. You know, you think that athletes really enjoy it. And we had a woman soccer coach come in that winter when I first started that winter, because actually my first few months there, I wasn't really learning much. And I was like, is this it? Like I just got a division one job. Like, and I was thinking of leaving and actually going back and interning or finding somewhere else where I could learn something because I wasn't really learning anything from anyone. And luckily, Brian Shrum was hired as a woman's soccer coach. And he started to challenge everything that I had in my brain, which was very uncomfortable. And it actually took me like two years to kind of understand what he was getting at. For example, I, I said athletes don't really want to be doing things. So he would say they don't want to be here. You want to be in the weight room. They don't want to be in the weight room. They're here because they have to be in the weight room. So Example, I was warm, I would warm up the women's soccer team, we got on the, we had this little court area, and I would do jogging, you know, forwards jog, backwards jog, dynamic mobility, stuff like that, do a few sprints to get the central nervous system going. And he'd be like, okay, you're, you're warming up their bodies, but why don't you think of how you're affecting their brains? And I was like, what, like, what do you mean affecting their brains? And I would just kind of shut it off, because it's like, you're making me uncomfortable. Let me do my job. And then I just come around to be like, these they're like zombies, you know, these kids, they don't really enjoy it. They don't enjoy this warm up. And now you're putting them into the weight room and they're not really in like in a roused state. They're in a state of just like going through the motions, the monotony of things. So the biggest thing, thing we did was we just changed the warm ups to make it like a game. So it's like you play spike ball, you play med ball, volleyball, or you play dodgeball, you play something like that. And you take the athletes from going in the weight room, looking like zombies to now you have a, a majority of them who have smiles or they're, they're starting to enjoy themselves. Or at least as a coach, you stimulate their brains more. You stimulate their visual system, their vestibular system. And you always have some kids who are like too cool for the games, who don't really want to do it on a given day. And you might have the majority. So that's where you just do the dynamic mobility or something like that. But anyways, the whole point with Brian coming in is he changed the way I saw my job as a strength coach. And I started to be like, I listened a lot less to other strength coaches because they would just complain about everything, complain about pay, complain about athletes not taking things seriously. Everyone's soft. No one's fast enough. They're, they can be so much better if they did things properly. Like how you do one thing is how you do everything. Sayings like that. I kind of shut all that off and was like, hmm. that's garbage. That's not what I'm seeing. That's not what I'm experiencing. And for some reason, that's just still out there. But so when Brian did that, I kind of told him like, dude, you kind of ruined this. You kind of ruined the profession for me. You kind of ruined <laughs> being a strength coach and I don't want to be a strength coach anymore. So it was just this process of, I started making more money online. So I was less fulfilled at the university and then I just decided to leave. So I kind of owe Brian that because he, he heightened my level of knowledge, the way that I see things, but he also kind of ruined the college strength and conditioning job <laughs> because <laughs> I was no longer fulfilled with it. Yeah, I like that. I mean, if we think of the job and credit to like, you know, the pioneers like Boyd Epley and especially in a sport like football where that has become such a cultural and, and importantly so part of what athletes do with being in the weight room. But when you look at some of those other sports that are not quite as collision oriented, there's not such a history or a connection with the gym and the weight room. I learned a lot in working with men's tennis at Cal. I remember my first year, year there, I kind of came in and you know, trying to be, I was trying to up my seriousness game too, in the sense of being a track coach before at Wilmington College. I think it was a little bit more fun. I, everyone called me by my first name and I was trying to restart and have everyone call me Coach Smith and stuff. And I was trying to be a little bit of a hard ass at least. So I did all the typical stuff like the movement prep and, and all that and the, all the sets and reps. Everything was pre-programmed, you know, regular, regular strength and conditioning session. And honestly, I'd never seen so many long faces like ever, like people who just really, I don't know. I think I convinced myself that they really did want to be there doing that and that they needed it and it was really good for them. But they just there was something that was wrong, like with them, <laughs> you know, and, and I need to figure out what that is. And I will say that group that first year in particular definitely was not. I had other groups in later years that were more gym oriented. And and I think that is a good thing. Like, I don't think that it's like, oh, you're a sport athlete and you should just care about your sport. Like, I do think 
having that work ethic in the gym is good. But the big thing that I noticed was like, as soon as I went out and watched those tennis players play, like I saw so much emotion and fire and like, and, and you see all this explosiveness too, that is dwarfing the muscular contractions that they're doing in the weight room. <laughs> um, largely on account of, I think that they weren't as excited about the weight room, but just seeing that like unfold and manifest over time, I, I definitely followed that route of, Hey, let's warm up with basketball today and then we'll lift. And that was like the best warm up ever, or just finding ways to do games and getting them engaged. And yeah, everything that, um, like Scott Robinson has said on this podcast, uh, that Rafe Kelly talked about that was he, Rafe's Rafe's talk was a big catalyst in me doing more games with that group and other groups too. But yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, that was such a huge changing point for me as a strength coach. Cause it's like, you have this this field is a young field. It's not like it's been here a thousand years and it's perfectly figured out that this is what all athletes need, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dude. But I think the difficulty is if you're a college strength coach, you're making, well, often you're making bad money. And there are a lot of kids who would do your job for free. There are probably mm-hmm. thousands of kids lined up that want to do your job for free. So you have to, you feel like you have to impress the head coach. And if you come in and you say, we're playing dodgeball for 10 minutes, like the coach might be like, why am I paying you to have him play dodgeball? I want you to do an mm-hmm. elaborate warm up. You know, I want you to bring the foam rollers and the bands and all this like special stuff out, like the eyewash. But I kind of got over that because I was that way for a while, but I got over it. And it's like, dude, let me just sit back and watch because they don't need to be exactly look at them in sports. Like you can't coach them 24 seven in sports. So why am I coaching them 24 seven when they get in a, in a lifting session? Why can't I leave them alone for some, some part of it? And hopefully they, cause I think what we're getting at is like, if the strength coach, we take it so seriously and we need more work ethic and everything, I'm like, you're fatiguing these kids. You're fatiguing them more and more and more. And when they get to their sport, they're more likely to get hurt and they're probably less explosive. But the more stuff you're doing as well, it's like you're fatiguing their brains and they do not want yeah. to be there. They, don't, they do not want to do the things that you're forcing them to do when they're in a fatigued state. So if we just did less, you know, if we just step back, maybe you do 50% of the volume or you do 50% of the sessions, you'll actually get them coming in and, and doing high quality. But the frustration is, it's like the way it's like the way it's always been done. And coaches will say, "Well, this power five school did it this way, or this person did it this way." And you're a strength coach, so you're just subject to keep the coach happy. So that was kind of that was a big frustration for me. That I did, I did get through sometimes, but some coaches you can't get through. And um, yeah, I just I just kind of got sick of it, man. Yeah, I, I hear you with that expectation of job description. I think that it is interesting, like with the coach and. As the longer that I think coaches have been, or the longer a coach works and is mindful, I think the more uh, you'll hear from elite and established coaches, they'll say, I say less like now than what I did 10 years ago or 10 years before that as a coach. Like I say less. And it is, I mean, at the true, it makes you think, well, what does a coach do um, at its core level? And especially like a physical or a strength coach. And I, I get it. Like with, uh, if you come in and athletes are playing games and maybe you aren't coaching and cueing every athlete up and you're just kind of letting there's maybe more self-organization to put it in a particular way. Like there's coaches of like, Hey, what are you doing? Like, what is, you went to school for six years and did all these internships to do this. And yeah, I, I, I hear you with that stuff. I think that, yeah, for me, it just took, um, establishing, you know, I mean, I, I worked with men's tennis for eight years. And so it took some established trust over the years to get to that place. I think where we could just, you know, go play basketball and then go lift and those kinds of things. And or some of the other bigger changes that I made. It I think I'd be able to find that it does just take time. But it's it's cool that the things worked, you know, working the other way. Like I learned so much from a lot of the sport coaches that I worked with in ways that that I, I would have never seen possible before I started working with those sport coaches. And they definitely made me better. And a lot of all the sports I worked with each in unique ways and it all impacts my program writing. So very cool that you had that experience with soccer. If you had anything else to share about that, uh, let me know. Otherwise, I was also going to ask you some things that you've been learning uh, working in the private sector outside of the typical university setting. Yeah, I, well, I think we'll feed into things because it's like you were saying like, well, what's the point of the strength coach if you're coming mm-hmm. in just having them play games or whatever? And I think the, the point should be that you have a strength coach that is very knowledgeable about physical development, that they can form a very good starting point for like an objective starting point for what physical development is going to be for this team. And then they can go out and do it because you're not just taking kids and saying, all right, let's play a game. Just random, Mm -hmm. the most random stuff in the world, because you do have knowledge. And if you can form a starting point and kind of get rid of all this, this garbage that's out there by kids saying, well, this guy did this, or this guy did this. And I want to do this. 
if you have a good starting point, you can get rid of all that garbage and just focus on the things that are going to lead to better uh, physical development. So I think we'll get into that talking vertical jump because that's, I think that's the, the basis for vertical jump is having a good objective starting point. But I think as a coach, that can be the use. And then you could explain why they're playing dodgeball instead of doing a forward lunge, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do think too, I'll just add this quickly is I think a good, it's almost like a good strength coach can play the games because of what they know. And you know, it really, I felt like I was able to gain a little bit of an intuitive sense of, okay, now it's time for the game to be over. We do need to get this much lifting in today. You guys need this much just to stay resilient. You know, we'll do some ISOs, whatever. It was like a soup, you know, and you have to have a certain amount of each thing in there. Yeah, if we would have, <laughs> clearly if we would have only played games, I don't think that would have been the be- in everyone's best interest. Although I still think that would have not been terrible, you know, but I mean, there's, um, there definitely was things that needed to be done. And so, yeah, there's, there's definitely that level of artistry and intuition. How much game should we play? Okay, now they're ready to lift. Let's do this much lifting. Okay, this will be the finisher, X, Y, Z. But still, it, it still, it became much more fluid too over time. I found myself changing the, you know, all right, we're going to cut this off the workout because that game was really good. We were getting a lot out of it. You know, we, maybe you didn't have to play for a couple of weeks so we could afford to play more games and the more risk inherent there. And I found myself mixing things around a lot more too. Uh, shuffling things later in the workout as almost as the game i was i would learn based off the game too as you kind of feel what to do yeah yeah definitely okay so yeah tell me a little bit about what you've been learning working in the private sector uh, as opposed to the collegiate sector yeah okay so i've been working this job in i'm in minneapolis it's at a hockey center so like a lot of hockey guys pro hockey guys college uh juniors and then younger kids so I'm not a hockey guy, uh, but my buddy from college got the job. He wanted me to come out, help him out for the summer. So I'm assisting him. Uh, Nathan Welty is the head of performance at Velocity Hockey Center. And it's, we do a lot of triphasic stuff, Cal Dietz, uh, like Cal Dietz influence, because it's Cal Dietz is a hockey guy. It's kind of like what the program is that we run there. So, but it is interesting. So mainly I, I'm not in charge of programming. I, we, Nathan and I, we talk a lot, but we do look a lot at uh 20 we so we do 20 yard sprints and then we look at basically force velocity profile are they good at force are they better at velocity and then we can change up their training based more speed more power more strength but it, it, it it's interesting talking about kind of what we were talking about with the we have these pro guys we have these college guys we have these younger guys and how you have these younger guys and we can do so many games with them and then it's like these pro guys they come in and it's like very few games they just want to get the get the workout in get done you know, which is cool. And also they're pro guys. You might be making millions of dollars. Do you really want to risk it by playing yeah. some game that they potentially might get hurt? But they're, they're more about business. It's, it's you don't have to like they're not young kids that are want to just mess around all day. They want to come in and get their work done and get out of there. So that's one thing that's, that's pretty interesting because those younger kids, I think they do need more games. But as you get to the higher level of, of sport, it's like we have the sport and then we have the training and everything is there to make you better. So I hope that gives kind of a lesson to what I've been learning. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome because I mean it's good for me to hear that. I don't work with any professional level um, hockey athletes, let alone like basketball or soccer or football or anything like that. So I think sometimes I tend to center my conversation and thoughts around the audience I have in front of me or the the athletes I have in front of me. And of course they want to play games, you know, like they're younger oftentimes. And so I definitely understand that with the older players, it makes you think what like. What are your thoughts on, I, it's very intuitive with younger players, play games, their brains light up and you get novelty and all those things and they're more ready for the, the work afterwards. But a pro player, if you were to try to you know, ignite their brain for ba- lack of a more specific term, you know, get the neurochemicals flowing that are important to their enjoyment, to having joy in what they do. I mean, is there any other way that you'd think that might be helpful for that group that's just like, ah, I just want to get in, get the work in, get out? Like, I mean, any any ideas outside of gameplay for them? Or uh, I don't know. I think, <laughs> and I'm not I'm not saying this. I think strength uh, coaches talk and they say like, I it's all about relationships. It's all about this, and it's like, are, are you telling me you got a solid relationship with every athlete you train? Like, you think it's all about relationships? Like, I don't have a a perfect relationship with everyone. There's some people that are just harder to connect to than others. But I think when you take those groups. It's just, they come in, they're getting their work done, everything. So they could try to make it an enjoyable experience, you know, mm-hmm. try to relate to these guys, try to not make it like you're a robot and they're a robot. But yeah, they're just, it's just not that level of interest to do those is not there. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the 
20 so years that they've just been in a strength and conditioning setting where they haven't had much of that. And it's just what they expect. Like, let me come in, do the dynamic warm up, get the lift done and I'm done or do the conditioning and I'm done. Um, I don't know what it is. I guess I would have to follow like an entire group of athletes throughout their lifespan to see if one is just doing it that way and they come in, no, let's just get this work done. And then the other group that had games their whole life is like, let's get the games and then lift. I just don't know. But I think, man, I think attempting to have that human element within training is probably just, just the way to go, <laughs> whether you're playing games or not. Yeah, I agree. That's something I've been thinking of a lot. And maybe with the pro athletes, I do. Th- I guess I think like Michael Jordan would be a good example of someone who I think knew who to navigate, who navigated that field really well in the sense of, uh, I was reading this in Josh Waitzkin's book, uh, The Art of Learning. He was talking about how like a great athlete or any athlete following periods of intensity needs to like just chill out. And when Michael Jordan sat on the bench, he just like, you know, leaned back through his towel over his shoulder. Like he wasn't like biting his nails on the bench. He he had to cool down so he could get back on the court and kick everyone's ass or he would go and play golf. Right. And just like take it easy. And maybe that was more of like maybe on the pro level, maybe it's just something completely outside training is their place to take it easy. I don't know. I don't actually have a lot of experience with that population. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know either, but they uh, the pro hockey guys play a ton of golf. I don't know why that is. <laughs> they play a ton of golf all the time. But uh, yeah, I think you remind me because in that uh, Franz Bosch book, he was talking about the athletes who want to know the reason for everything they're doing in training and how it's going to correlate to sports. And then you have the other group of athletes who use training as like their escape from sports and they don't want to hear anything about sport at all. And they just want to lift weights, you know? So I think that that's was like an interesting distinction because you do have the you do have those groups of people that are like, what what is the reason? Why am I why am I doing everything? How is it going to help me? And then you have the guys that are like, I just don't want to think about that. Let me just train. Yeah. Yeah. And it I would say and not to completely generalize, because I, I mean, I don't think I've worked with enough elite team sport athletes to say, but it seems like the ones who ask questions about everything, at least within the individual sports I've worked in, worked in the people who are the question askers were not the most fluid reactive athletes <laughs> um and i was gonna say too with the keeping the brain engaged i guess for an elite i i do think about like the marinovich system and the time i spent with gary and my mind is fresh on this too because i was just at rafe kelly's retreat and i was reading a book called the exuberant animal by i think frank Ferencich. i'm probably pronouncing his last name wrong but one of the cool things they had in there was that in nature There's never a definitive time to whatever your sprint, for example. You don't know how long you're going to sprint for because you're like being chased or you're hunting something, you know? And so, or think of any time you play a sport for that matter. Do you ever really truly know? I guess outside of baseball, right? The bases are X amount apart. But outside of like those types of things, do you ever really know exactly how long you're going to run for? There's always like this like novelty even in each sprint itself and something I appreciated that Marv well, Gary did, and I'm sure Marv did it as well. And they worked with a lot of pro athletes was like the the coach guided the set. You'd be like, do half reps, your quarter reps, reverse the movement, you know, and the coach was kind of in tune to the set and guided the athlete through. And anyway, for what's worth, I feel like that could be um, something that maybe for those athletes, maybe that would be a way to get them into that element if they needed to. I don't know. Like, I mean, there's been a heck of a lot of pro athletes who have probably done just fine doing just standard normal lifting and then going and playing golf to get their their uh, their release <laughs> outside their sport. So, you know, I just think it's 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 at least a fun thought with the the expand the you know active set. But it's is it something we absolutely need? I don't know. It's just interesting. Yeah, yeah, and um, I have not been around it for long enough, so I I can't really like give many lessons because I've only been really around it for like a couple months. But um, it is it is interesting to see. And yeah, I can't I, the thing you said about like the the per- people who are like hypercritical and need to know exactly everything. It's like, I don't know. They they yeah, they I, I agree. I would probably agree with you that it's like they are not like that or they are like that when they play sports and you might want them to be more mm-hmm. fluid, you know, less less thinking. And there there are the guys who just they're good. They don't know why they're good and they don't question anything. They just come mm-hmm. in and train. I wanted to take a break from the show and briefly share with you the difference that performance herbalism can make for you. Several years ago, I had Logan Christopher, CEO of Lost Empire Herbs, on the show to talk about hypnosis and mental training for athletes. While talking to him, I realized he also had an herbalism company. So shortly thereafter, I used the Phoenix Formula, which was my first product I bought from them. I had great results with it, not only increasing my energy and decreasing my need for coffee and caffeine, 
But I also noticed that it was making an impact on my lifts and my weight room numbers. I was having a great training experience. Shortly thereafter, I also got into the shiliagit resin as well as other herbs. And I don't look at supplementation the same way. I'm a strong believer in what Logan and his company are doing in looking for a natural resource to boost human performance. If you want to check out the herbs that I use personally from Lost Empire Herbs, you can head to www.lostempireherbs.com slash justfly. There you can get 15% off your order, and they offer a 365-day money-back guarantee. Definitely check them out. Let's get on back to the show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, there's the certain parts of your brain that do need to get shut off a little bit, I think, to be an elite athlete uh, versus others. So with everything, too, um, in the last... A uh, year or so, or even more. I mean, I guess it depends on how much you want to share, but and as well as you doing your podcast and talking with so many people, any big updates or thoughts with the world of vertical jumping? Obviously, that's a big thing that you do. So, anything that's been um, really, I, I guess, not, I want to say a game changer to make it sounds like so big, but just adjustments, things that you've been considering and doing differently lately with vertical jumping. Yeah. So, well, let me, yeah, let me talk about. So I gave rugby strength coach Kier Winham flat had this module or this, this fundamentals course. And he wanted me to do a section on vertical jump training. So I did that and it took me a lot longer than I thought mm-hmm. it was not that easy to do. And I think it goes back to when you were talking about the strength coach who can do warmups, who has an easy time just being like, let's play dodgeball because he has so much knowledge and he's, he's not fearful of losing his job or something like that. And has a good, would have a good explanation. So that's the thing James Smith would talk about that. A good, a good explanation is one that stands up to criticism. It, sh- it should stand up to all criticism from anyone. So I think if you have a vertical jump plan, it should stand up to anyone's criticism. And this is mainly what I've been focusing on in the vertical jump world, which is what is the objective starting point for vertical jump development? Because there are guys who say you need to do calf raises or there are guys that are like, I got gains on air alert or I got gains on jump attack. You know, there's just so many anecdotes. There's so many stories and there's so many different exercises. But I think you can clear up all of this confusion by having a solid objective starting point. So I gave this fundamentals course for Kier and I started it out with, because I think the, the most solid thing you can start it out with is physics. Like your vertical jump development needs to start with the basics of physics because we're on earth and we have gravity pushing down against us. And if you want to elevate, you have to obey the laws of physics. And that's, that's what's going to make you jump higher. So I, I put a quote in there, which is from a, a physicist, Ernest Rutherford. He said, all science is either physics or stamp collecting, which was like he was a physicist. So maybe he said that because he likes physics or whatever. But it was interesting because stamp collecting, then you look at all these people that talk about vertical jump development and they'll say like doing hops and doing skips and doing, you know, one leg, two leg. And if we look at this quote, it's just like, that's just stamp collecting. You know, you're just putting things in categories just for the sake of categorizing them. But it's not actually telling you it's not telling you much. It's not telling you, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's not telling you many, much concrete evidence for what vertical jump development is going to be or what vertical jumping is. So that's where I tried to create this objective starting point, which would just be based on the laws of physics. So let me just go quickly on laws of physics, because it, it's very simple. If we just take the, the Newton's laws of physics, first law would be an object will not change motion unless a force acts on it. So we should focus our vertical jump training on force developments. You know, you have to produce force very quickly because gravity is pulling down on you and you have to apply force to fight gravity and get vertical in the air. And then his second law would be the force on an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. So if you are a heavier dude, you need to lose some weight. If you have a lot of body fat, you need to lose weight and then you'll jump higher, very simple. And then his third law would be when two objects interact, they apply forces to each other of equal magnitude in opposite direction. So it's like you apply force to the ground and the earth is massive. So the earth doesn't move, your body moves. If you applied force to something that was a lot smaller, that thing might move and you might move. Mm. But because the earth is so big, you're the one that is going to be moving. And then that also means that as you increase your output and you go from a 20 inch to a 40 inch, you have a crazy amount higher collision that you have to deal with on the push off and on the landing. Um, so if we just simply look at the laws of physics, the first, second, third law, you can take this understanding and say, we need to apply force. We have to apply it very quickly. You can't have too much uh, body weight. And then you have to manage volumes because jumping has a lot of collision, especially as you uh, increase your outputs with jumping. So I think that should be the starting point. And then we could get into how your body deals with it, which would just be your neurological side, your nervous, your central nervous system, your peripheral nervous system, 
and then your structural system, which would be muscle tendon. So that would be any type of training that could affect your neurological system, could affect your structural system to help you jump higher. But I think that we need to start the vertical jump development, the vertical jump training with the objective starting point of what is vertical jumping? And it's going to be based off of uh, physics. And then you can create a good plan. <laughs> uh, I hope that makes sense. Sure. I mean, how um, my question would be uh, with that in mind, and I like the the idea of the the earth doesn't move too at, with like the collision. Cause I, one of the big things I have been thinking about a lot, or at least been keeping in my mind is when does the earth give back to you? And when do you, you know, be, when are you propelled and where's the timing in that when putting it that way? And also like the stamp collecting thing too, the putting things in categories idea versus a more, like a more holistic element. I had never heard that before. Um, but what I'll ask is how is, um, or is, what you mentioned different than um, just a very simple like strength to body weight equation, if that makes sense, like a hey, squat. And obviously, if we want to jump high off two legs, squatting strength is very helpful. Um, but how does that does that go beyond uh, or how far does that go beyond or interact with the idea of uh, squatting X amount to jump a particular height? Yeah. OK, so, well, it could probably fit in. It could probably fit into that. But I, I it's not necessarily about like just applying like you have to apply force in the specific manner of jumping, which squatting a heavy weight would not be applying force in the manner that you would get from jumping. So if you want, if you want to get as practical as possible, you take all that physics understanding and you say, you need to jump, you know, mm -hmm. you need to practice jumping over and over. And if you need a boost, like you need a neurological boost, you need a structural boost, uh, you can do, get, do the strength training, get stronger. And I think most people would need that, but can you get stronger by just jumping? Yes, you can. Uh, but if we look at if we just look at those laws and then we say, how does your human body deal with that? Some people are just not built for that. Mm -hmm. And they need they need extra training. Uh, often you'll see the guys who are who are freak athletes. They, they might not have needed the training. They just were kind of born with it. Their neurological system and their structural system was decent enough for them to slowly progress over time. But with a lot of jumping, maybe that could be because they were born in a good environment. They were exposed to a lot of games. They never really had that many injuries. and they just naturally jumped higher over time. I don't know what the exact reason would be because everyone's very different, but yeah, there's a lot of things that could fit into that. If we create that as the objective starting point, there's a lot of things that could fit into it. Like you need to get your squat stronger, squat to body weight, relative, relative strength or something like that. Even like having a lot of elastic volume for your ankles, you know, there's, there's many things that could fit into that to say, how do you develop your body to deal with the forces that are uh, it, that are part of living on earth and how can we jump higher because of it so i think there are a lot of things that can fit and then there are a lot of things that probably don't fit like saying let's do a ton of let's do a ton of calf raises for a vertical jump well how does that improve your ability to apply force if you're very detrained maybe that would help but for someone that is higher trained probably not and i think i think it just covers everything cuz the third law is huge on like the health cuz it's all about collisions and if you have all of these collisions and you can't handle it, then we need to do something to get you back into a healthy state, get your body back into a healthy state. Because it is about force, but it's also about you staying healthy in the long run. And I talked to uh, quite a few pro dunkers and a lot of guys, are, my friends are jumpers. And it's like, everyone runs, runs into knee issues. Everyone runs into anterior knee pain, or they might tear their ACL, they, but it's just jumper's knee, uh, quadriceps tendinopathy. It always comes up. So it's all about collisions. How do you deal with the collisions? How do you get yourself back to deal with those collisions when you have an injury? Just a thought actually that popped in my head is it seems like in the last maybe 15 years, not exactly sure, but it seems like the, like in the eighties or maybe the nineties, it, it seemed that the, the highest you could get up would be off one leg. And it seems like the running two leg jump has just become as dunking has gotten more and more popular. Like the running two leg jump has gotten be to become much more and more of a thing. And I don't know about, um, I'm sure, you know, clearly lots of people had knee issues in the nineties, but do you think that there might be anything, um, out there with like a running two leg jump versus a one and, and knee pain issues or some of the trends that show up in some of these dunkers? Oh yeah. Sorry. I um, dropped a bomb on you. This might just popped in my head. So sorry. <laughs> Dude, I, I would have no idea the difference is one and two leg. Uh, all I know is that if you jump crazy high, you're probably going to get knee issues. Like, it's just, I, I just think it's unavoidable. Like, I, I don't know if jumping, maybe jumping is just kind of jumping as high as possible for a decently high volume. Like, would a caveman do that? 
Yeah, that, you know, yeah that's kind of what I was thinking. We, like how far from our innate function might we have gone if we have specialized in a certain type of jump because it's kind of a thing. You know what I'm saying? Like that's just where that came from. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know. And, and But it does seem like those two leg jumps are a little bit slower. And those one leg jumps is always like a, a lot higher joint angle. But as far as what does that mean for like the type of stress it puts on the knee, I, I actually don't know because there is a lot of collision going into both of those jumps. and maybe maybe a lot of that collision too is when you're when, on the landing uh, i mean i just don't know there's a lot of there's a lot of demand on the jump and there's a lot of demand on the landing i just don't know the answers i don't know how you would even study that to figure out the answers <laughs> yeah 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 no i i don't know either it's probably it's extremely speculative it's fun to speculate sometimes like i think if i'm a caveman like what purpose of it is it for me to run and jump as high as i can in the exact same way off two legs for I don't know, 10 times in a row or something, you know, I don't, unless I'm playing a game, you know, or something like that. It, I mean, yeah, it's maybe just a little different than, you know, where versus, I guess, like the idea of us being wired more to um, sprint, to swing and to throw perhaps as maybe more base rotational things. And then jumping is a more violent redirection. We've gotten really good at it. Like the dunkers now are so amazing compared to um, like what you would see that what would win like the dunk contest in like the eighties or nineties. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's a pretty complex question. I just like kind of thinking about these things having been in the jumping world for a little while. Yeah. If, well, if you add in, if you want to talk like specifically tendinopathy, it's like, I've talked to uh, Ebony Rio Mm -hmm. and, uh, Craig Purdom said this too, that humans and horses are the only mammals that get tendinopathy. Uh And yeah. So if you want to add more speculation to your thing, it's like, (laughs) well, why, (laughs) you know, like, That's why cool. would that be the thing? Why would we get tendon issues? And like a kangaroo does not get tendon issues. If a kangaroo is jumping around all the time, they don't get tendinopathy. Like, why would that be a thing? And we just get tendinopathy from too much jumping. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't know the reason. Yeah. Does any other animals? Yeah. Now I'm like interested in this. I don't want to divert too much. This is where my brain goes. But I think, um, you know, I always feel like we can learn a lot from the animal kingdom. And uh, do, how many other athletes outside of like horses? I mean, I'm sure you have like zebras or donkeys or similar cousins, but like the horse runs really fast and it's got like the horseshoe. It's got like, like a cheetah has more dampening, right? Or a cat has more dampening. Like it's like that long kind of softer, maybe. I hope I'm not butchering that. <laughs> and then as humans, like we are, we're just like completely immobile compared to the animal kingdom. <laughs> I, I do know like, yeah, like the knee joint, I've heard stuff say like the human knee joint is like, why was it designed this way? Like people tearing their ACLs all the time. And like, <laughs> what a liability. No, I mean, I think the, I mean, the human body is designed in maze incredibly, but it is interesting where injuries do tend to show up and different things like that so ah I'll, it's something i'll have to think about over time for sure <laughs> yeah yeah the knee, the knee joint very interesting because it's like you have the you have that kneecap sitting in there and recently i was looking at the fat pad because you have a fat pad behind the knee and they it can you can get a huge issue when you have a fat pad irritation from like a hyperextension or something like that it's extremely painful and they're like we still don't know the role of the fat pad so it's like <laughs> why it well <laughs> why is it even there yeah i feel like everything is there like you know people talk about like why the it used to be believed like the appendix had no function it's like wait no it does play a function the gut biome and like you know the the but these things that we think do not i'm yeah i'm i don't, I don't know i'm curious why uh <laughs> why that is there but uh anyways i know we're going to get into some temp- tendinopathy uh, i'd like to chat with you about um just a couple follow-ups on the vertical jump things and so one, you're talking about jumping a lot. And I mean, what, um, what kind of volumes, you know, you've talked to a lot of like high level dunkers and things like that. I always feel like the volume of dunking is kind of different than like high jumping or a different jumping sport potentially, because you could do more dunks, you know, like different types and different types of takeoffs. But what have you noticed in terms of like, what kind of volumes a lot of these athletes are doing or what they grew up doing, you know, like on lower rims or stuff like that? Yeah. So, um, I've talked to a few of the pro dunkers, uh, on my podcast. I would, I would like to talk to more to get a, a complete picture of it, at least for that small group of people. But it seems like they all start out. It seems like they, they played multiple sports when they were younger, but they would jump like every day They would, when they were younger, they would jump all the time. Like Jordan Kilgannon would jump for hours every single day. Isaiah Rivera jumped a lot. Jordan Jonathan Clark jumped a lot. And as they get older and their outputs increase, they do not jump every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, They jump a lot less, like two or three times a week. One, well, maybe once, twice, maybe three times a week. And they always get into strength training. These guys who are, who are big into uh, the dunk world, they, I don't know, they just get into strength training because I think that can kind of give you, that might've been in your podcast where it's like the, the health, what what was it? 
like the toxin and then the oh yeah the, I forget well, the, the antivirus i think derek evilly referred to string string as an antivirus or something like that yeah like yeah, it, yeah 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 so i guess that type of idea would fit in of like the a lot of the violent vertical jumping that you can get in the weight room and do something slow for knee extension or slow for your your soleus or something else that could help protect your knees um yeah so all these guys they do the crazy high volume of jumping and then as they get older their outputs increase you just have to do less and then you keep in the strength training to, just to keep the health of the body and man it's interesting because i went into a lot of these podcasts thinking like i don't know what i'm gonna get out of these guys they're probably just genetic freaks they don't know anything about training but they're they're so knowledgeable about dunk training they're so knowledgeable about uh programming and periodization um it's crazy and you have to be so in tune with your body to uh, be able to do that and for the most part they look like those i think we've talked about this those like narrow isa guys those like really elastic guys don't weigh too much like i don't know 170 180 type pounds so it's like for myself at like 210 220 trying to dunk um maybe i should just cut a bunch of weight and be born with a different uh infrasternal angle but um yeah those are those are just some commonalities it's, it's very interesting to talk to those guys i would like to talk to more pro dunkers to see what their path was like through time but dude it's a lot of jumping it is a ton of jumping over a lifetime no one is going to say that you're going to increase your vertical jump a crazy amount in one month it's going to take you five years or 10 years or 15 years and you really have to love dunking if you want to do it you really have to love jumping if you want to do it. So that's how you're going to last for five, 10 or 15 years or 20 years. Yeah. I think for me at age 37, like having done pretty much, I think I've done pretty much everything that you could count as training for vertical jump. I'm sure I haven't done everything, but most, I would say most of the things that people have done that fall within, uh, and maybe even some falling without the realm of normal training. But like, I think if if it was like I have to jump as high as possible within like I don't know six months I I would need like a community and a low rim <laughs> and like because it's like just to do just to, for the joy of it you know like just things that bring you joy and I think I've realized that more recently and you well you mentioned it earlier on this podcast like just being um, like having that joy of training and you think about the the background of all these jumpers. Uh, Daniel Bach just said this too, and he was on the podcast a few shows ago, how his, he just did low rim dunking and started lifting weights and it just really boosted his vertical in a short period of time when he was a young athlete, like 15 or something like that. And it does make me think about, and you would look at um, like Stefan Holm, who has the, I think he still has the height overhead jumped high jump uh, world record. There's like a picture of him jumping over a little like PVC pipe when he's five. And he looks like he's having a great time, you know? And so that, that combination of joy and exploration and constantly wanting to do it, I do think there's something different to that than just being like, oh, well, I guess I got to get, you know, 100 reps in. Here we go. <laughs> you know, like as if you did the same jump every time, right? Without that emotional state or the diversity of fun and, and play and all those things, right? It's, but it makes perfect sense, like in, in any skill. Like if I want to be a good, like throwing athlete, maybe I did a lot of throwing sports and I don't know, like had a lot of snowball fights or I was always throwing stuff, right? Like I can even see that in my, my three-year-old son a little bit, how he enjoys that kind of thing. And it's almost like you have to build that. It's not almost, you have to build that, that big database of all those movements and all the ways the tendons and fashion bones adapt to it. And then, yeah, like later, I, I do think that's important. You mentioned like you can't, once your power output is so high, you if you do it every day, you're probably asking for it with, uh, with injuries and things like that at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, the community is huge. And for myself, I traveled for like three, four months and I would get maybe one dunk session a week, two dunk sessions a week. And my knees were, my knees were so sore, actually, uh, like patellofemoral pain, some patellotendinopathy. I guess maybe we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. But as I come back, it's like I have a friend from high school in Minneapolis and some other friends. So having the people to do dunk sessions with is huge. Like your vertical. Uh, Austin Yokum, you had Austin Yokum on, mm -hmm. and then one of our friends came out from North Dakota. We had like ten guys at an LA Fitness out here one Friday night, and everyone's vertical jump was probably up like four inches. Yes, you know, <laughs> we <laughs> yeah. were all throwing out crazy dunks. And if you can get people around you like that, as you get older, I think as you're when you're a kid, it's so novel and it's so motivating for you to get your first dunk. But as you get better at dunking, and it just kind of becomes a thing. I think you really got to find people around you who want to dunk if you want to keep getting better at dunking. Because for me to be by myself traveling the country was like, man, it was pretty tough. It was pretty tough for me to go do dunk sessions like by myself at like an outdoor court or something. But if I'm if I'm out here with friends and you just get this big group of people that are all about dunking, you you jump so much higher and you get such a better training effect. 
Yeah, that's a massive, massive part of it. I think I didn't understand just how big of a thing that was, especially growing up. Like, it'd be at the it'd be open gym, and we'd finish the first game, and you'd try to be doing dunks with a few people, or or maybe my buddy would do a dunk that I've been trying to do for a long time. It's like, oh, you know, that, that would like just stoke this fire in me to want to be able to do that same thing. And you can't, you can't just like. I, I think that a lot of my training has been, in, in a way, has been kind of this uh, post. I'll say post college has been a little bit of a lonely road in the sense of it became more about what are the exercises and what's the magic formula and and let's try this training for a while let's try that training for a little while but then at being absent of the community is so substantial like that that can commu- and even seeing too being in the midst of uh, elite level uh swim swim programs at cal you would see the community that those coaches would create and how that was just such a massive part of that as well and it was just it was really cool to see that all form up or, or some of the other experiences i've had is in um community-based physical uh, activity-based ventures with training uh, it's really substantial yeah and um that's i think that's the problem with dunking is not a lot of people love dunking there's not a huge amount of people like you can't just travel the country and find uh people that love dunking and want to go do dunking sessions with you because it's like if you can't do it, you got to do it by yourself. And if you've been doing it for a decade plus, it can get, you can get, it can get pretty hard for you to just be like, you warm up for a while and then you're just like, I ain't feeling it. My knee's a little bit sore. I'm just going to cut the session. But if you have a group of people around you, there's no way that you're going to do that. You're going to go and dunk and you're going to get a training effect out of it. But what you, people ask me too, like, what's the best warm up for dunks? And it's like, if you can play pickup basketball, yep. like 3v3, 4v4, if you start playing full court, you might get too exhausted. But if you can start playing pickup basketball for like 30, 60, 90 minutes, that is the best warm up to dunk. You'll be, you'll be so ready to dunk after that. Yeah. Um, way better than any potentiation or any, anything you could possibly do. Um, yeah, I think it gets back to like lighting up the entire brain, giving you all these variety of movements, maybe like connecting with your feet really well, like the, the fascial, whatever the fascial mm-hmm. system warming up. I, I don't know what, what the exact reason would be, but playing basketball for 60 minutes or 90 minutes is going to probably give you the best vertical jump you can have. In some way, I actually don't want us to learn the reason why. You know, it stays a little transcendent, a little mystery too. Like exactly, you know, we could go into all the neurology, right? But are we ever going to really know exactly? No, it just is the best warm up. And I was going to kind of jab at you a little bit because uh, for me, full Kurt was really good. But maybe that's because I was an elastic and a narrow ISA and, you know, weighed 175 pounds and you at two two fifteen going full court might be a little bit too much fatigue. <laughs> I always like <laughs> I always liked full court as a warm up. I was okay with it. <laughs> uh well, well you know what? okay uh, yeah sometimes it's decent but it's like um, i'm kind of weird cause it's like i'm six foot and 215 so it's like if i gotta play down in the post which i should the guy might be like six foot six or whatever a lot taller than me and if i gotta guard if i gotta guard a guy up high like a point guard i just cannot move my body fast enough to stay in front of him so it's like uh the defensive side is just always very tough because offense offense i pretty much just want to stand there and shoot threes that's just that's just what i do stand there chuck threes and they usually go in yeah. Um, with the um, basketball as the warm before we started the show, you were talking about your time with Jeremiah Flood, and um, you were saying something about what he was doing with like the playing in fly tens and stuff like that. Do you want to re- recap that real quick? Because I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So I went out because I was in California, and Jeremiah, I had him on my podcast actually a long time ago. But um, I just kind of I went out to see what he did for a session, and I wanted to get some videos, uh, potentially make make something of my own of like what he's doing because I think it's very different. I think it's very cool. But yeah, he get the the sessions I saw, get the kids in, do whatever, like warm up. They might do some technique work for sprints, do a few, whatever, get the, get the blood going and everything. And then it's like, they played a lot of gator ball. So they played gator ball for like 30 minutes, which was like, how do you explain gator ball? Kind of like handball, like rugby, like a lot of games all together. You play gator ball for like 30 minutes and then you go do some fly tens, you know, see if you can hit a PR and then go play gator ball for 30 minutes, go do some fly tens again. And it might be like 90 minutes, two hours or something, but. Um, yeah, I personally, cause I went out with them once I've actually never, I've actually never ran a fly 10 until we did that. Um, but we played gator ball for like 30 minutes, maybe 60 minutes. And then I ran a fly 10 and I think I got like a one, one second. I don't know. Something like that. But <laughs> a good, uh, good thing anyways. it was two seconds. <laughs> <That's kidding. laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, it's like, you have these ideas of like, you're going to feel warmed up in 10 minutes. So you're going to feel warmed up. The, the dynamic warm up for a sprint should take five, 10, 15 minutes or something. And I think you miss out on the brain because if you can stimulate the brain with gator ball, your, your, your visual system, your uh, vestibular system, your proprioception, put it, put everything together, just get this light up within your brain. 
you're going to feel a lot better going into a sprint. And that's, that's felt for me there. And it feels for, feels for me now. Cause it's like, I'll go play med ball volleyball. I play spike ball for like 20, 30 minutes. And I feel pretty ready to sprint. I feel a lot more ready to sprint or to jump after that than I do if I did like a sprint or, or jump specific warm up. So I think, yeah, I think, I think the warm ups need to start going towards getting the entire brain involved, mm-hmm. which would be your just, which would, I guess, be a game. Like why else, what else do we need to change? Let's just, just play a game. Yeah. It's uh it's funny to think of, well, if I had to, like I said before, like to try to pick apart all the things that make it the better warm up. but it's like at the end of the day, it is, it is a game. I do think, um, the lateral movement too, is a big one with Bobby Stroop had mentioned, uh, like I think coaches at Baylor noticed that if you did the pro agility before the 40, you ran a faster 40. So it's like, you're getting like the lateral work engages, like, I don't know, I would just call it like the fullness of the musculature. Like you're, you're engaging uh, more 3d motion that will help you run faster. But I noticed that as well. I didn't, I don't know if I mentioned it on this podcast, but back uh, this winter, I was training some track athletes and we would warm, we would run a few twenties, things like that. They were actually distance runners. So we just kind of ran it for fun, but we started doing it where we'd play like soccer or handball and every 10 minutes we'd go and run a 20 and I smoked my PR at least from this past year since I've moved to Ohio in playing those games. I mean, it wasn't even close and I was weaker. Like my squat was worse than it was like several months prior when I was running slower and the other, and one athlete dropped like almost two tenths of a second doing that. It was like, Whoa, this is, uh, I mean, if this isn't the best warm up for the 20, like, I don't know what it is. Like, this is, this is really phenomenal. And so when you mentioned that Jeremiah had done that, and I mean, I imagine those athletes were getting similar results or seeing similar, like boost to that sprint. I, I would love to actually see the, the slow-mo video, like the, bio, the analysis of, all right, let's go do a triple, a typical warm up, you know, da, 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 and then run and, and then have a coach, like give them like two cues too. Right. And then, uh, and then have someone just play a game and then whip out the fly 10 and have them run once or twice and then see what that looks like and compare anal- uh, mechanics and time and all those things. I think it'd be really interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely would. Okay, just um, maybe a couple quick um, other vertical jump questions and then I definitely want to get to uh, some of the knee health stuff. Uh, so quickly, as much as you want to get into, um, I, I actually, I really appreciate you putting this out there, but thoughts on the ever popular idea of a big penultimate step. So take a long penultimate and then a quick last two in a, in a running two leg jump. And I, perhaps I like this question a lot because I, uh, Juan Miguel A. Cavaria, the long jumper with a massive long last step, very unorthodox for a long jump. I, I swear he has shortened that last step, at least the last Olympics. And he's not jumped nearly as far as he did a year or two ago. So I, I mean, who knows exactly why, but, um, I love unorthodox ideas, um, with people who break all the rules. And so what is your thoughts on penultimate length in those, that running two leg jump? <laughs> well, I, I'm just a contrarian just because I enjoy being a contrarian. So anytime there's a guy with a crazy vertical and a baby penultimate, I'm probably going to sc- uh, screen record it <laughs> and share it. <laughs> but yes, The majority of people that are good jumpers are probably going to have that longer penultimate stride. Personally, I do not. My left side, my left leg has a long penultimate. My right does not. I don't know. Is it a past injury, training history? I mean, who knows what it could be. But yeah, I I just am kind of against that whole idea of like put have this big push through the penultimate. Because if you watch anyone that is carrying any amount of speed it doesn't look like they're pushing through the penultimate. It just looks like they're rolling over that ankle. That's like a, a Darian bar. Cause that was one thing I picked the Darian's brain on when I've met him a few times because I'm, I just care about jumping. I don't care about sprinting. I just care about jumping. So um, his thing was like, it's not a push through the penultimate. It's a roll over the penultimate. If anyone's ever carrying speed, if you're starting from a dead stop, then you want to push through the penultimate because you need to, you need to get some speed going before you can jump. Mm-hmm. But if you're already carrying a ton of speed, you don't need to push any further. And if anything, if you did attempt to push, it probably would mess up your next your next step going into the jump. So I think it depends. It always depends on what type of jumper you are or how much speed you're carrying into the jump. Because if you have no speed whatsoever, you're probably going to be served better with a long penultimate. I would say this too, though. If you are working with a new person just going into jumping, they're probably going to have a baby, a very short penultimate. And it's probably going to lengthen out over time just naturally. You yeah, don't have to do anything. Own. It's probably yeah. going to lengthen out. Yeah. yeah. But one thing I was thinking was when, let's say, let's say you're pushing off the right and then you go into a left, right plant. If you have a lot of speed and you're getting this huge penultimate and it's going left, right plant, 
you're putting a lot of stress on that left leg, especially if that left leg is like locked out or more straight. That is a lot of, let's just say collision, a huge collision for your leg to deal with. And if you're not used to jumping, your body doesn't want you to do that. So if you're just, if you're just forcing a long penultimate, you're putting yourself into a position that could potentially be more injurious because you're not ready for that collision. And your body knows you're not ready for that collision. So it's just shorten your penultimate step. So it's like, because then you can, you can shorten it up and you can get the other foot down faster. So you don't have to put all of that, all of that collision through one leg. So yeah, I just, I just leave it alone. And you'll, yeah, you'll have people who hop into it, especially people who would never jump before. They'll just hop into it and they'll basically land on both feet at the same time. But I just think uh, if you want to get better at it, just jump more. It's going to naturally clear itself up or film yourself on slow-mo. And then maybe you can change it up a little bit if you want to. But I think the body's doing that for a reason. And as long as you're, as long as you're carrying speed into the jump and you're maintaining somewhat, your body's somewhat low so you can load up and you're not like hopping, having this big vertical, like vertical to vertical jump, but it's more like horizontal to vertical. As long as you're carrying speed and you can stay somewhat down and then slowly rise up, I think you're fine. And you can accomplish that with a small penultimate and you can accomplish that with a long penultimate. Yeah, I, I liken that what you, you say before you had like the three laws of physics with jumping. And to me, it's like that's almost the laws of physics as applied to a running jump, because it's like as long as you're not losing too much speed or the minimal loss of speed is occurring, the body will find the correct like length of penultimate, the correct impulses. Ideally, I guess the question would be, well, what if someone doesn't and who's to say, I guess what trying to figure out is this your best length or not for the penultimate. But I, I think about like Ulamar Rojas, who just set the world triple jump record for she destroyed it with like the world's shortest like middle phase uh, like I, that i've ever seen in an elite competition it's like is someone gonna she just crushed the world record are you gonna go out and tell her that she needs to have a long phase you know it's just it's amazing how the body can put together what's needed to maximize each of those collisions it's like okay this collision's gonna do this and this is this and yeah i think like someone who is has a short penultimate and is losing speed yeah maybe they're the people who, if they did a longer one, maybe it just causes them not to slow down as much. I don't know. Maybe they did jump a lot there, but it would be awkward, um, probably awkward for them. And I would say, too, because sometimes, I, I mean, if people come on, this is one thing kids do, like young kids. They see one penultimate video, and then they look at me with the short penultimate or anyone with the short penultimate. You need to lengthen that out, and you'll <laughs> jump higher or something. It's like, well, hey, guess what, dude? What, maybe I have, like, patellar tendinopathy at that moment. And if I did lengthen it out, that would hurt worse, you know? Like, so I basically it's like go on the injury history. Like maybe someone's presenting that way because they have an injury. Maybe someone's mm -hmm. presenting that way because they had a huge injury history in the past. Like you just do not know the story to be giving these canned technique tips to people because they just, they shouldn't yeah. exist. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I think that that's definitely rampant in track and field for sure. Everyone wants to, <laughs> you know, I guess, uh, pe you know, peg everyone to be the same kind of athlete. And we all, I think we all find validation through knowledge and things like that. So it's just the more, you know, I think the more you realize that the human body is brain is pretty smart at doing what it's doing. So, you know, unless an athlete is completely no like motor history or something, I think, like you said, that usually that length gets figured out on its own especially given an athlete's doing enough jumps and it's you're athletic enough, which hopefully is the case for most people. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Knee, t knee stuff, knee stuff. Let's get to this. Um, I know we've chatted on this a little bit before. I'm really excited to get to this and maybe I'll frame it. I'll start it right here is we've had uh, a lot of really good people on this podcast talking about how uh, isometrics and knee health. So basically, and that is a strength coach standard, I think is, Hey, let's make sure, you know, we mitigate tendon pain, Let's make sure isometrics are in the program. Is that going to be good enough for all types of tendon, you know, issues like tendon pain, tendon issues, or is there a different types that different exercises and modalities might be better for? Yeah. Okay. So I think we had talked earlier and it's like, it can get pretty confusing because there's so many, if you have anterior knee pain, pain in the front of your knee, like there are so many presentations, things that it could be, but I think you can rule out a lot of them. And I think for the most, most people, it's going to be patellar tendinopathy. It's going to be a tendon issue. And that could be patellar or quadriceps. So patellar below the kneecap or quadriceps above or Osgood slaughter, which would be like down at that tip, uh, tibia all the way down yeah. to tibia. So let's just lump all that together. That's, that's a whole tendon issue. Or you would have patellofemoral pain, which would just be like the general knee, knee pain around the kneecap. So the tendon issues would be more like a jumper's knee issue and the general knee pain would be like a runner's knee. I don't know if people are familiar with those terms, mm -hmm. jumper's knee versus runner's knee. So the thing you have to make sure is isometrics, heavy isometrics, like a leg extension 
is going to be huge for the patellar tendon and the quad tendon and Osgood Slaughter. It'll be great for that. But that heavy isometric will probably not be good for a patellofemoral pain. If someone has patellofemoral pain, just general knee pain, they might do, both groups might do decently well with like an iso lunge, but doing the heavy, heavy isometrics is, is amazing for tendons and you'll get pain decrease immediately. And you can just like do a few sets of that and then go into your workout and that could, that's actually a stage of getting the tendon back healthy, like the Keith bar you had in the episode, doing a lot of those isometrics to get the tendon healthy. But the problem is a lot of people don't have the tendon issues and they have the patellofemoral pain. I would think someone like a lineman in football, because a lot of linemen have anterior knee pain. And then they're like, oh, you have jumper's knee. And just look at a lineman. Like he's a huge <laughs> dude. He's not really jumping. His knees might be caving in. They probably are because he's just a wider hipped individual. He's a lot of excess body fat. Yeah, you just see, you can just see it. You can just see his knees and say, if you have knocked knees, I don't think you have. Patel- I don't think you have a tendon issue. I think you have a patellofemoral issue. So, I would say, hopefully, to people talking about knee health, is figure out if it's patellofemoral pain. Figure out if it's actually a tendon issue. If it is a tendon issue, very simple. Isometrics are huge. Iso lunges, uh, isometric leg extension, Spanish squats, all that stuff is going to give you immediate relief. But if you do those exercises and they don't have immediate relief, they probably don't have a tendon issue. So that's how you could rule that out and say it's patellofemoral. Or you could just look at the athlete. If it's like, usually if it's a female, they're not going to, females are a lot less likely to have the tendon issues because females have wider hips, their knees come in. You just have this weird, like they have a less solid patellofemoral joint. The way their kneecap sits with their knee, just kind of weird. So it causes this weird stress around the kneecap and they just get general knee pain in the front, which often gets diagnosed as a tendon issue. But the guys who get the tendon issues, they're usually explosive athletes, usually strong athletes. Mm. They're guys you can see just, they just look like athletes and they're going to present with that type of pain. So to make it simple for the audience, if you get, just try the heavy isometrics. If you feel right, if you feel better right after, it's probably a tendon issue and keep doing them. You're going to be good. Mm. If it's a patellofemoral issue, then you need to start looking at just general strength and conditioning stuff. Like the ankles could be a contributing factor because you might be, you might be limited in supination or pronation. The hip might be a limiting yeah. factor. You might just have weaker hips or something like that because that's the knees are a product of the ankle and the hip. But if we're talking about the tendon issue group, they usually have a pretty solid ankle and a hip and they just are too explosive for their own good or something like yeah. that. Or like the Osgood slaughter is like more of that growth fight thing. You know, the younger kids get it. Um, and then the quadriceps tendon is like volleyball players, Olympic lifters, landing in a deep squat explosively just puts a lot of stress on the quadriceps tendon. So um, those are just all things to keep in mind. But I think, I hope that that is simple enough that um, you have the tendon issue and then you have the femoral issue and you need to make sure that you're treating the right one or the person probably is just not going to get better. Yeah, right on. That makes me, I guess, to me, the two thing I think of um, like, I think of like Gary Ward's wedges stuff and just trying to get the foot to work. Let's get your biomechanics to optimize. Let's get your, you know, your cell to pronate and, supinate properly and let's integrate that into some single leg movement so that would be more um so that that's um, potential to help someone would be more on the level of general i have air quotes but general because they had general what is it exactly i don't you know but like um more general but if it's very specific in the tent that's where like the keith bar the ebony rio old isometrics we've had on the show that's where those are more that's the wheelhouse there yeah it is and and but at the same time too with the gary ward stuff because there is correlation with uh, like if we want to go into the research, like correlation with lack of dorsiflexion and having jumpers knee. Um, so I, but I think that comes from, if you're a basketball player, you're going to twist your ankles, you know, you're mm-hmm. going to sprain your ankles all the time. And you have those ankles that just get stuck in supination because you twisted them so much to the outside that it's stuck in supination. It doesn't want to pronate. And if it doesn't want to pronate, it definitely doesn't want to dorsiflex. Um, so those Gary Ward wedges or just looking at the feet for anyone with knee issues could be huge. Um, it's probably just going to be more, uh, across the board with a patellofemoral joint issue than it would be with a patellar tendon. Cause a patellar tendon could have everything solid and you just did too much jumping. You just mm-hmm. did way too much volume for your tendons to handle. And you just need to settle that thing down with some isometrics. Got it. So that also makes, I guess it could work in the reverse, right? Like, I guess for me, like I could be like, oh man, I got my biomechanics optimized. I can pronate. That still doesn't mean I can do unlimited jumping because now I'm digging into the tendon and that's where that, I just have to be appropriate volumes and, um, you know, I, I, isometrics for care there. So, um, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. I feel like I had something else to say with that, but 
Um, no, that's a good, that's a good way of putting it. I think especially too, just cause we tend to like look for panaceas, like, all right, you know, we're doing strength, you know, strength coach. Let's just make sure we're, you know, we're doing, <laughs> we're doing strength training. Let's just make sure we're doing, we're doing strength coach things. We're doing strength training. Let's just make sure we have isometrics in here that we don't, you know, there's no thought beyond that versus, Hey, maybe this person just needs to spend some time on their, uh, pronation to be ability to flatten all three arches and things like that. Oh, I, uh, here's what I was going to say. I did remember. Um, Connor Harris was just on and was talking about a lot of basketball players are kind of stuck in late stance. They're very late stance oriented because of the nature of the game. And perhaps that might lead to the decrease in dorsiflexion. And then for them, he talks about you know, showing them their heel, showing them mid stance, just kind of me spitballing. I wonder if that um, maybe that would be, I was just thinking in related to the, the knee issues. I wonder if being almost so four foot dominant that I, I don't know. It's curious. It's always gonna be a yeah, complex situation, yeah. right? But like just knowing, um, which biomechanical things we want to look at for different types of people and what they're, what they're working on. Yeah. It's like, um, it's like predicting the weather, you know, mm-hmm. we can never predict the weather. So it's like, can you predict when a tendon issue is going to come up? And no, you can't, um, mm-hmm. you can do some like things to hopefully reduce the like the likelihood, but how do you know that it might come up or not? You know, like you look at James Harden and he's, his like crazy anterior tilt way forward on his toes and one of the best basketball players in the entire world. Yeah. So it's like, are you going to step in and be like, hey, you're too much there. We need to get you back on your heels. I mean, maybe you do. Maybe you do with some like... Yeah, if he, had, if he had injury issues maybe or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think I think that's where it would come in of like, when do you intervene? You know, do you intervene when like, I'm completely healthy, I'm completely mm-hmm. fine. Should we step in and be like, hey, we need to completely revamp your biomechanics? Um, or do you step in later on? I mean, who, who knows? No one knows the answer. People that have know the answer probably sell it to you for like thousands of dollars. But, uh, (laughs) um, I don't, I don't think there's an answer out there, but I, I think if you had a person with the knee pain, then that's where you start to look at everything and be like, well, could this be a contributing factor? Yes. Could this be a contributing factor? And let's, yeah. So if you're so far forward, let's get you back on the heels. Let's get rid of that crazy anterior tilt. Cause maybe now your hips can't work like, like, like they should. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's putting more stress on the knee. But if you're completely healthy and you're, you're performing well, maybe in your strength conditioning stuff, you do some stuff where your body is missing, like your body might be missing the posterior tilt or it might be missing getting back on the heels. So maybe you add some of that stuff in to not just give you more and more and more of what you already have, but uh, to do it and be like, we're preventing injuries. We're preventing yeah. tendinopathies with this. I mean, you just can't say it because you just don't know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right on. Well, that's yeah. I mean, it's always there's that complexity, which we've we've gone into a bunch of times, which is cool. But um, yeah, it's really good to just to have those kind of laid out and that ideas. I've, I think I was always just kind of the singular ah, I'm doing my ISOs, this should be fine. And then you could have some that's a little unexplained. Actually, it's getting me thinking a little bit about my right knee versus my left. My left is very Osgood slaughtery. I think my right's actually more general. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll do some work there and I'll report on it and get back to you. So <laughs> I appreciate that. I know you've done, I mean, you've done, I didn't ask you like a background, but I know knee pain has been your and, um, injury prevention has been your thing for a long time i know you've interviewed a lot of people on your podcast too with that um yeah it is and the because dude i have i have i got so much knowledge i was in san diego just doing podcasts over and over and over uh, about neurology and about biomechanics and my knees were pretty bad like my right knee patellofemoral pain my vastus lateralis was locked up because whenever you get patellofemoral pain you usually see that your vastus lateralis gets locked up and your VMO might start getting Mm -hmm. smaller. You get like this weird pull to the outside. And that could be because uh, pelvis is anterior tilted. You don't have as much internal rotation there. Um, Some of the biomechanical factors that could go into a patellofemoral pain. And then my left patellar tendon was pretty sore. Um, But just to give my anecdote, hopefully people can take something from this. Um, I came back to Minnesota in the beginning of June got around my friends again, started working at a gym, moving around all day, playing bas- pick up basketball, um, dunking all the time and knee pain pretty much gone. Um, so I didn't do it. I didn't do anything different in terms of isometrics or in terms of any of the loading protocols or anything like that. I just came back and just started moving around more and started doing athletic things. Cause back when I was in Cali, it's like, I would train for one hour a day and then sit on my computer and my knees hurt pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. But I think that can be overlooked of if you're just not doing anything for the a majority of the day and your knees hurt and you're doing the isometrics in the morning and in the evening, and you've been doing that for months and months and months, maybe you need to look at what you're missing. And if you're missing general movement, if you're missing the uh, movement within a sport by getting your whole brain lit up and doing 
six, 60 minutes of basketball, if it can be pain free, um, that stuff is huge to reduce the likelihood of injuries. Um, so I think, yeah, I think just, man, training the brain, like making sure the brain is going to be stimulated day after day after day for hours with it within certain activities, like huge, uh, huge effect on pain. And I think hugely um, overlooked because we just say, let's do the ISOs and get better. Mm -hmm. But I do, I will say this, a lot of people who get the, the jumpers knee, they're basketball players in the first place and they're playing a ton of basketball. So they don't need more basketball. Mm -hmm. They probably need these slow, heavy strength work. So yeah. get them on the heavy leg extension and that's what their body is missing. So it's always like, look at what your body's missing and then let's go train that. And hopefully that's going to decrease pain. Yeah, right on. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and bringing the mental emotional too, I think is big time stuff. But yeah, just learning how to intelligently fill that bucket of what is, what are they not getting of the fast, the slow, or looking at biomechanics. Um, it definitely helps us all to be better coaches. So, well, awesome, man. Hey, I think we're running out of uh, maybe time and phone battery a little bit, but I think we're able to get everything covered. And uh, Jake, can't you thank you enough for uh, sharing your knowledge and insights with us? I appreciate you being on. Yeah, for sure, man. It was great. Thanks for tuning in for another show. If you enjoyed it, you can help us out by leaving us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever you're listening to. We'd really appreciate it. We'll see you guys next week.